We have talked about saints and we have talked about the intercession of the saints, but today we're going to talk about the greatest saint of them all. Why does the church love Christ's mother so much? Why is she so important? And why is the oldest Christian prayer we have ever discovered a prayer directed to Mary? Out of all the videos we have filmed so far, this one feels like the most personal we've done yet. Our Lady is so close to the hearts of believers in the church that just to talk about her as an idea is very wrong. It is a real person that we are introducing here today. It is someone that is very close to us. So if there's anything in this video that you find difficult to comprehend or understand or that upsets you, please don't have a debate in the comments. Follow the links in the description for more information, keep researching, uh, talk to a priest and continue that journey. This is just my introduction to why we Christians in the church love Mary so much. In the first episode on this show, we said that the beginning, the middle and the end of everything we talk about when we talk about the Christian faith is Jesus Christ. And this applies to any conversation that we have about his mother. Christ is a part of every Christian conversation. And something we'll touch on in later episodes when we talk about imagery will be that in almost every single image of Our Lady, she is holding Christ and pointing us to him. In Orthodox tradition, we very rarely call her Mary. It feels a bit cold and impersonal just to use her first name, and we have other titles for her. So one of those titles is going to be explored in another video. But for the purposes of this one, we will call her Mary. Now, the fundamental reason we love her so much is that she gave birth to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our Messiah. As with the saints, we love her, but we do not worship her. And any Orthodox Christian or Catholic Christian, if they hear you suggest that we worship Mary, will be genuinely shocked at the idea. We do not worship Our Lady. We love her and we revere her as the mother of Christ, the person through whom salvation came into this world. She said yes to Christ. And if you're familiar with your Bible, if you've read the stories, you know how rare that is for someone just to accept what God has asked them to do. And she does this straight away. She said, let it be. Our love for her has its roots in scripture, in history, and in theology. Now in the Psalms, for instance, we hear that God has made mankind a little lower than the angels. And yet when an angel visits her, he calls her the highly favored one, blessed amongst women, having found favor with God. And he says all of these things before he even tells her what it is that she has been called to do. When she visits Elizabeth, it is Mary's voice that causes John to jump in Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth sees Mary coming to her and says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Elizabeth is actually echoing the words of David when the Ark of the Covenant came to him. The Ark of the Covenant contained the Old Testament, the old agreement. Mary contains within herself the New Testament. When she hears the news from Gabriel that she is going to give birth to the Son of God, she says, Behold, all generations shall call me blessed. Now, this is recorded and preserved in the Gospel of Luke. We are those generations and we call her blessed and have done for 2000 years. We know from the scriptures how much Jesus loved his mother because the story at the wedding at Cana, it is his mother's intercession that prompts Jesus to change water into wine, the first recorded miracle in the Gospels. The early church fathers found references to her all through the scriptures, and they saw her presence in the story of our salvation from the very beginning. For instance, in the Old Testament, it is said that Solomon's mother, the queen mother, stood at his right side. Every king in the Davidic line is mentioned with their mother at coronation. And the role of the queen mother in the Old Testament is a position, it is a title in the court. Psalm 45 praises God through analogies of a king. And there it mentions the queen standing at his right side. And we know, as I said, that the queen was the mother of the king. And yet in this psalm, she is also referenced as being the daughter of the king, because this psalm is talking about God. There is a woman who gave birth to God incarnate, but who was also the daughter of God. And that is Mary being mentioned there in the Psalms. And if Christ was king, the son of David, from the Davidic line, it was essential that we knew who his mother was, because the queen mother job was a real job, a position in the court. The king's right hand is his symbol of power, and at his right hand is his mother, the queen, ready to present to him petitions from the people. And in the book of Revelation, there is a stunning reference to a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and the church fathers saw this as a beautiful representation 
of Mary. And you can see from all of these references that the queen does not supplant the king, her son. She doesn't co-rule with him. She does not share the throne with him. She isn't greater than him, but she is there at his right side as a part of the royal court. And we know that the Christian love of Mary has been going on since the very early days of our Christian faith. We have Irenaeus of Lyon, a third generation Christian, studied under Polycarp, who studied under John, and Irenaeus calls her the second Eve. Jesus is the second Adam. We knew that already, but where is the second Eve? And think about it for a second. All Christians from any background will agree that the greatest man that ever lived was Jesus. Now, obviously he was God as well, but he was also the greatest example of masculinity that has ever been. Any man who wants to be a real man has this example of a great man. Where is the greatest example of femininity in history? Who out of all humanity has ever shown the finest example of what it is to be a woman of God. And this is her, the second Eve. Because the first Eve messed up, the first Adam messed up. So the second Eve makes up for the mistakes of the first, where the second Adam redeems all mankind from the mistakes of both of them. It is truly epic. Elsewhere in that second century was probably written the prayer that I mentioned in the opening. The oldest Christian prayer we have ever discovered is a small parchment that dates back to the third century. And it is a prayer to Mary, which means it was probably written sometime in the second century because archeologists will say, whenever something appears in the historical record, it has probably existed at least a century before that. And Christians have been praying this same prayer around the world for almost 2000 years. And this isn't to mention later images of her in the catacombs in the third century. She has been very important to Christians from the very beginning. I've heard the objection that well, there's nothing special. God could have chosen any woman, but he didn't. He chose one that had found favor in his eyes. He chose her. The Catholic Archbishop Fulton Sheen once said, it may be objected. I have the Lord. I have no need of her, but he had a need of her. There is another story of a Protestant man that argued with a Catholic priest and said about Mary, there is nothing special about her. She is no better than my own mother. And the Catholic priest said to him, Maybe that were true. Maybe she is exactly like your mother. But look at the difference in the sons. And there it is. To whom did she give birth? Do you know who her son is? Her son redeemed the world. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but I have only one real aim in my life, and that is to follow Jesus. All I want to be is to be a disciple. I want to be a disciple that Jesus loves and what that means is to follow him, to follow him to the very foot of the cross and to have the honor of hearing him say to me, behold your mother.